Ilias, Quantum Billiards und Quantum Chaos und then I will come to the special properties of graphene billiards. There I will shortly introduce some experiments which we performed uh, to simulate artificial graphene and which will be now continued in Lanzhou. And then I will speak about spectral properties of neutrino billiards and uh, trace formula. And then I will come to an outlook if there's still some time left. So here I show two examples of billiards. One is um, yeah, an integrable one is a rectangular billiard, is an integrable one. Africa billiard is a chaotic one. That is due to exponential instability of the dynamics after some time. Uh, the motion becomes unpredictable. And um, the, correspond the eigenvalues and eigenwave function of the corresponding quantum field are obtained by solving the free space Schrödinger equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions. And um, we are interested in, um, in quantum chaos, and one central question of the in the field of quantum chaos is how these properties of a regular or chaotic dynamics become visible in the properties of the corresponding quantum system. And one um, aspect of quantum chaos is the understanding of the features of a classical system in terms of the fluctuation properties in the eigenvalue spectrum of the corresponding quantum system, and this is what I will talk about. So there exist um, predictions. One is uh, by Barry and Tarber, a conjecture, and essentially they prove that the spectral properties of generic integrable systems coincide with those of uncorrelated random numbers from a Poissonian process. Then there is a so-called Bruegger's Bernard and Schmidt conjecture. They stated that the spectral properties of generic classically chaotic systems coincide with those of random matrices from the Gaussian ensembles. In this context, one should mention that uh, similar statements were already made before by Barry in 1977. And then there's a paper by Cassati, Wald, Gries, and Guarneri, where they also stated a similar conjecture and they studied spectral properties of nearest neighbor spacing distributions and Borigas, Giannoni, and Schmidt um, also considered long range correlations. So the generally, I mean, they, they conjecture that the spectral properties are generic and if the classical system is chaotic and time reversal symmetry is preserved, then you expect that the spectral properties are well described by those of random matrices from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. If time reversal invariance is violated, then you expect uh, agreement with those of um, Hermitian random matrices from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So I give some examples. And so in my talk, I will have examples where you don't have a pure GOE, pure Poisson, or pure GUE, and there I generally consider have to consider an, a random matrix ensemble which actually interpolates between Poisson and GOE or Poisson and GUE, uh, depending on how you choose H1. So H0 is a diagonal matrix which contains random Poissonian numbers. H1 is a random matrix from a GOE, or in some cases I chose a random matrix from the GUE, depending on the type of problem. And the variances of the matrix elements then have to be chosen such that the eigenvalue spectrum of H0 and H1 are in the same range. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to use such an ensemble. And actually, I mean, when you look here, then you see that when you go with lambda to infinity, then you will have GOE. And for lambda equal to 0, you will have Poisson. However, this already happens for values of lambda, which are of the order of 1 depending on how you choose the uh, variances. So I chose them such that you have it at a value of round one. So and to determine this value of lambda, I usually use an analytic expression for the nearest neighbor spacing distribution and then obtain the parameter lambda. And here I now come to the spectral properties which I consider now in the following, just for those who are not familiar with it. One are the nearest neighbor spacing distribution between adjacent eigenvalues. So if you have an integrable system, then you expect a Poissonian distribution. For a chaotic system with preserved uh, um, time reversal invariance, it's a so-called Wigner distribution, which decays Gaussian-like for large S and increases linear in S for small spacings. 
and for the GUE it increases uh, like a square. So this is a main difference between these two ensembles and how you can um, distinguish between both. So and there are other quantities, long-range correlations. One is a number variant, sigma 2, and the other one is the delta 3 statistics, which gives the least mean square deviation of the number of levels in an interval L from a straight line best fitting it. And here one you has to unfold eigenvalues, that is one has to make sure that the uh, spectral density is uniform. And this is what I will always assume when I show these results. So just to show some examples, I mean this is a rectangular billiard um, and you see it's the nearest neighbor spacing distribution integrated, nearest neighbor spacing distribution are very close to Poisson. This curve is GOE, the full line, and dash dotted line is GUE. And here see where the number variance and delta 3, you see some deviations depending on the length of the interval. And this is, I mean, actually it's very difficult to get a perfect Poisson for rectangles. You have to choose a ratio which is a rational number and uh, you have to compute like several, 100,000 levels. Here I just chose 10,000. In this, and here I show an example of the spectral properties of Africa billiard. It agrees very well with GOE, both in short range and long range um, correlations. So this is all I wanted to say to the classical and quantum billiards. Now I come to graphene billiards. Now what is graphene? Graphene is a monolayer of atoms which are um, arranged on a hexagonal lattice. This hexagonal lattice is actually built up by two independent triangular lattices. Um, this leads to a, a band structure which actually made graphene so um, famous. I mean, here I show the valence and the conduction band. And um, the both bands touch each other conically at the six corners of the first Fourier zone. So that is in the vicinity of these um, cones of touch points, the um, uh, dispersion relation is um, is linear. I mean, here it's plotted versus the energy is plotted versus the uh, quasi-momentum vectors, and the distance from the um, from these touch points it goes conically in the vicinity of these cones. And this has a um, important implication, namely in the vicinities of these touch points, you can describe the system by the Dirac equation of massless fermions, and actually the the degeneracies are exactly those touch points of it. Therefore, the, the diabolical points are essentially are called Dirac points because of this property that you can describe them by the Dirac equation. And this made it so important. Now, this property is actually not uh, solely um, um, restricted to graphene, but it's valid. Also, it can be constructed in any system with this symmetry. So where there are many different examples where artifi artificial graphene was constructed and we also did experiments and I will explain shortly how we realized artificial graphene. Now first let me define what is a graphene billiard. A graphene billiard is a finite sheet. Uh, so it's a hexagonal lattice of a finite sheet. Um, and here I show one with the shape of a rectangle, one with the shape of an Africa billiard. And we actually studied these systems experimentally. So, and to describe them um, numerically, you can use a so-called tight binding model, which works quite well. I mean, we used it to describe our experimental data, and you had to use first, second, and third years neighbor coupling, and then you, we got a good agreement with our experimental results. And um, the eigen, so we do d essentially determined the eigenvalues of graphene billets experimentally by using um, superconducting microwave billiards, and here we use the analogy of a quantum billiard with a Schrödinger equation, and um, a microwave billiard, the Helmholtz equation describing flat cylindrical microwave billiards, and this um, mathematically, so they are mathematically identical as long as you choose the wavelengths, um, the wave number below a certain maximum value, which is in inversely proportional to the height. So if you choose very flat ones, you can get simulate quantum billiards in a very quite large um, energy range. And we chose such systems to obtain the eigenvalues of a quantum billiard from the resonance frequencies, and you can also measure wave functions. 
by measuring the electric field distribution inside such um, cavities. So we, I will only talk about this part here. And um, here are two examples of artificial graphene billiards. I mean, these are superconducting microwave billiards. They are constructed from a basin and a top plate, and the basin contains metallic cylinders which are arranged on a triangular lattice. And this then will result in artificial graphene. So in these two, there were several hundred, I mean, close to 1,000 metal cylinders had to be milled into a brass plate, and this brass plate and the top plate were then covered with lead. And then you obtain um, superconductivity below a frequency of liquid helium. So they were cooled down uh, to liquid helium temperature, and then you had a, um, a resonator with a very high quality factor of 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 and could um, determine like 5,000 resonance frequencies. That is 5,000 eigenvalues of the corresponding um, microwave billiard. So here I show an example, the rectangular one, and here you can see the black dots are the metal cylinders and the voids actually form this hexagonal lattice of um, graphene. So, and here you can see first there are three band gaps and in between, you have two regions of low density, and these are exactly two Dirac points. I mean, they are the frequency of these touch points in the band structure, so they're the Dirac points. And if you look into them, then you can see that you have a very low density in these regions, and um, somewhere here in this region, you have here the Dirac frequency. So here I just show the integrated spectral density for the rectangular mic Dirac billiard, it looks like in graphene, also the spectral density, it has a typical shape uh, which you expect in a graphene sheet, and um, here you have a plateau of low density, and which is here seen as a broad minimum, this is exactly the region around the Dirac frequency, they are uh, bordered by two sharp peaks, and here two kings, and these are these peaks evolve into the Van Over singularities if you increase the size of your system. And the, these Van, Van Over singularities are always present in two-dimensional periodi periodic systems, so also in our system. So and here I compare the spectral density for the Africa Dirac billiard with tight binding model, and you can see it's very well described. We had to include um, first, second, and third years neighbor coupling, and now we looked at spectral properties, and for this we had to divide uh, um, the spectrum into three different regions. One region is around the um, band edges. In these regions we find um, spectral properties which are well described by the corresponding Schrödinger equation for the corresponding quantum billiard. So there we, see we don't see any relativistic properties. So it's described by a non-relativistic Schrödinger equation. And around the Dirac point, uh, they are well described by the Dirac equation of massless fer fermions. And we also, the in the vicinity of the Van Over singularities, you can also look at spectral properties. I will show some results. And there you see can see either the same properties as at the band edges Dirac point or something in between. I will, I will show some results. So here I just show the spectral properties for the rectangular and Africa shape Dirac billiards. And for the rectangular shape, you find something which is very close to Poisson. In this case, you even find a good agreement for delta 3 up to larger lengths, even though these were like 150 eigenvalues. So in the vicinity of the Dirac points, you have a low density, and so you don't have many eigenvalues there. And this is the result for the Africa shape billiard, which is agrees very well with GOE. So now the question was whether the spectral properties of a graphene billiard are also determined only by the shape of the billiard. And the answer is no. I mean, at this point, we stopped experiments in Darmstadt. And so the, what I will show to you now were all numerical results. And we looked at properties of circle sectors. I mean, if you look at a circle sector billiard, it's an integrable system. You can obtain the eigenvalues are given by the Bessel functions, where the index of the Bessel function depends on the angle of your sector billiard. And the wave functions are also, you can write down everything explicitly. And when you look at the spectral properties, you see something very close to 
Poissons in your snare bus basin distribution. Here you see deviations which are typical also for circular billiard. There again, it's quite difficult to um, to obtain a perfect Poisson in the long range correlations. And here I show now numerical results for the 15 degree sector graphene billiard. I mean, here I show wave functions in the vicinity of, of the band edges. They look similar to what you get in a um, quantum sector billiard, and also the spectral properties are close to Poisson. And I, I don't show the long range correlations, but there you find similar results. And this is generally what we found for any graphene billiard. As long as you stay in the region of the band edges, you will always find the same results as you would find in the corresponding quantum billiard. Now, in the vicinity of the Van Over singularities, you find something which is somewhere between Poisson and GOE, and there one can now apply this random matrix in ensemble, which I introduced to you. And the of course, you also see clear deviations in the wave function. This is expected because at some point the lattice structure should uh, prevail itself because you, you know that one over singularities in the rack point are due to this um, lattice structure. So this is expected that you will see deviations from what you see in the, at the band edges, but it was not clear that you will see um, something which is closer to GOE than to Poisson because the shape is the shape of an integrable system. And when you go to the drag point, then you find a very good agreement with GOE. So in this case, um, the, the shape doesn't seem to pay, play the important role, but it's the, um, the structure of the band edges, which actually lead to varying boundary conditions uh, for along the edges for the two triangular lattices. You have a question? Um, not in these. Here, we, this is more like a perfect graphene sheet. But we also use, uh, I mean, in the, this is just numerics where we use type binding models, so you don't implement any potentials. But of course, when you, in the experiments, hmm? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, we don't see implication of the symplectic ensemble, but we see GOE instead of GUE because you have this backscattering, so in this sense. Usually you would expect in the vicinity of the Dirac point something like, I will come to this later, GUE, but we see GOE, and the reason is the scattering from one, um, um, one conus to the other one, so valley, valley scattering in a sense. Yeah, exactly. But we don't see symplectic. But we can discuss later because I'm interested in that. Um, here's just one more example. This was a 60 degree circle se uh, sector. And here you see something which is Poisson in the vicinity of the band edges. Here we have a, here it ends with two zigzag edges, here with two armchair edges. And you see Poisson in the vicinity of the band edges. And you see two GOE in the vicinity of the drag point. So this is another example where you don't see Poisson, but you see something which is more related to quantum systems with chaotic dynamics. This is, would be expected, at least, but it's not the case in when you use a graphene billiard. So and now I come to the third type of um, billiard. These are neutrino billiards. I mean, the, this, um, there's a famous paper by Michael Berry and Montagon. They introduced these neutrino billiards as massless bit one half particles, of course, at that time they didn't know that there is mass. Now we know there is mass, but I continue to call them neutrino billiards because it's, it's a name which was given like uh, 30 years ago. And um, we investigated such billiards now. First of all, if you have a spin one half particle which is um, confined by some potential, which is living in some potential, then you can write down the Dirac equation. And here you already, you can show that this Dirac Hamiltonian is not invariant under time reversal. Um, under time reversal, if this potential V doesn't have uh, any symmetries and if it's non-vanishing, 
So if you have a potential which produces a classically chaotic dynamics in the corresponding Schrödinger billiard, then you expect GUE statistics in such a system set of GOE. That's why I said that in a graphene billiard in the vicinity of Dirac points, you would expect uh, GUE, but you don't see it because of these intervalley scattering. So we looked at such systems. I mean, what you have here, you have your Hamilton equation. Um, yeah, your Dirac Hamilton e Hamiltonian is given in this form. These are the Pauli matrices, this is the momentum. And um, you can now choose any parameterization of the plane. And we are looking at billiards. So depending on the shape of the billiard, you can use different types. One example is um, such a parameterization, which you can use if your, the shape is produced by a conformal mapping of the circle. And then you can write down the Dirac equation. And in all cases, either in this case or in more general coordinates, you will find solutions which are given in terms of plane wave expansions, essentially. And you can see here, so Psi 1 is given by this equation. And Psi 2 is distinguished by Psi 1 only by this additional phase. You have an additional L plus 1 and another additional phase. Here, e to the i chi is just this uh, wz divided by, by the absolute value. So this you can write down very generally. And now you can use such an ansatz to obtain the eigenvalues of a neutrino billiard. For this, you first have to define boundary conditions. I mean, boundary condition is you want to have a bounded system. So you expect real eigenvalues with the Hermitian Hamiltonian. So you should require that uh, Dirac Hamiltonian, after imposing boundary conditions, should uh, still have the property of self-adjointness. And this is realized by requiring that the normal outward current is equal to zero. So here I just show one example of an Africa billiard. You see that the current is tangential to the boundary and you don't have any normal outgoing um, current. And this boundary conditions um, leads to a relation between the two components of your pseudo spinal. So they are related by a phase, and this e to the i phi is just the uh, i phi phi is just the angle of the normal vector with respect to the x-axis. So, and you can write it down in the complex um, coordinates, complex plane coordinates, and it's given by this term here. So this relates both of them, and this is the only boundary condition you have. And uh, for a neutrino billiard with a circular shape, you can write down analytically the solutions. I mean, the, zero, the eigenvalues are given by such an equation, so you don't have zeros of a Bessel function, but you have a relation between Bessel function JL and JL plus 1. So if they are equal, then this corresponds to the eigenvalue of the circular billiard. You can write down the solutions for the first and the second component. They are again given by some here, and I miss, uh, no, it's correct, yeah by these two wave functions. And yeah, so that's uh, for a circle billiard. And generally, there's one more important thing, namely, when you have a neutrino billiard with a which has one mirror symmetry, then this does not imply that you can separate your wave functions into wave functions corresponding to Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions or corresponding to two types of symmetries. This is no longer possible in a neutrino billiard because, I mean, the boundary conditions are not fulfilled by, if you would do such, they don't commute with the mirror symmetry in a sense. So this is a one important difference between neutrino billiards and quantum billiards. However, if you have a mirror symmetry with respect to two uh, perpendicular axes, then this is like a two-fold symmetry, and then you can um, separate your Hamiltonian into two blocks, or if you have an n-fold symmetry, into n blocks. So this you still have, but only no mirror symmetries. To see the implications, I just showed one example. It's a rectangular billiard. This is a rectangular quantum billiard. I mean, you have your chessboard um, structure. And now when you go to the neutrino billiard, then you see don't, don't see any structure. In this case, you see some structure, but you already see that it doesn't fulfill uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. And this is a corresponding current which can look quite complicated, but still, for when you look at the spectral properties of a neutrino rectangular billiard, then it's still uh, Poisson. This is shown here. Here I chose a rectangular neutrino billiard with 10,000 eigenvalues, and you find agreement with 
Poisson, and here, like in the quantum case, you see deviations at the long range correlations, which will become smaller and smaller when you choose more and more eigenvalues. And for the Africa billiard, you find a very good agreement with um, GUE. Here, I again chose 10,000 eigenvalues. And um, now, and generally, you can, in most of the billiards, you cannot just uh, use this linear plane wave expansion to get your eigenvalues, but there you have to use some numerical methods. And one method is uh, for the method, for one of these methods, the boundary integral method, the starting point is the uh, boundary boundary integral equation, which is obtained by combining the Schrödinger equation for a, for a neutrino, a Dirac equation for a neutrino billiard and the corresponding quantum uh, Green function. And then Green function is a two by two matrix. You can um, write this down, explicitly write it down. And then when you look at this case here, where you have, a, where you have look at wave functions along the boundary here, you can implement the boundary conditions and then you can get one equation for the component of psi 1, another one for the component of psi 2. Now, um, just to compare with the corresponding quantum system, you find similarities if you look at, not at a, a Dirichlet or Neumann case, but at Robin boundary conditions. I mean, Robin boundary conditions means that you have not psi equal to 0, not dm by the psi equal to 0, but a combination of both should be equal to 0. And then, then when you compare the corresponding boundary integral with this one, then you can see that they become very sim that they are the same except for here an additional imaginary part if you choose for gamma of phi just equal to k. So independent of the boundary, but um, proportional to k. So now um, to obtain the eigenvalues, we use the boundary integral. And um, here we use a combination of psi 1 and psi 2 because this, I mean, for psi 2, you simply have to use the boundary condition. Then you get a boundary integral equation which doesn't have any singularities. That's a nice thing about this method. And this was all already um, by Michael Berry and Montagon already um, wrote this down, the corresponding equation. And then you will find one which is um, where the integrand is 0 at the uh, singularities of your H0 and H1. The prefactor is zero and vanishes faster, so you don't have any problems with these singularities, which makes everything simpler than in a quantum billiard. And here I first show some results for Robin boundary conditions, because just to show that when you use Robin boundary conditions in the sector billiard, you will never find something which is close to GOE, you will find deviations from Poisson, but they are not really large. So I tried different types of boundary conditions and um, you, you don't find something close to GOE. And when you look at the random matrix ensemble, then you, s you find that lambda is of the order of 0 0.12, which means that you are very close to Poisson. And the, uh, here are some wave functions. These are just distorted um, uh, wave functions of a quantum billiard. Now, when you do the same for a neutrino billiard, the 60 degree, 100 degree, then you find here a very good, very close, it's very close to um, GOE, at least in the short range correlations. In the long range correlations, you see deviations like in a sec quantum sector billiard, here for 60 degree, for 180 degree, and the, the, it's the behavior is similar. I mean, generally, you find for all sector billiards which with an angle which is smaller than 2 pi, you find something which is close to GOE, and one can also determine this parameter lambda by um, a fit of this random matrix model, and then you find that lambda is of the order of 0 0.6 in all cases. And the deviations from GOE may also be explained. I mean, for this one can look at the wave functions. One finds many wave functions which look chaotic, uh, except for a uh, symmetry, which makes the speckled statistics GOE instead of GUE, but you find also many wave functions which are correspond to wave functions localized around the diameter orbit. And this becomes even more um, visible when you look at the ellipse billiard. But here I first compare the length spectrum of a quantum billiard with the length spectrum of a neutrino billiard. And what one observes here is that 
only in the Dirac neutrino billiard, you only have uh, peaks at the lengths of orbits which correspond to an even number of reflections. And this was already um, observed by Klaus Richter when he did the sum calculation for graphene billiard. So you find only, I will come to this later again, but you only have um, orbits which have an even number of reflections generally. So this is one example. And now I come to an ellipse. So this was the second we observed. I mean, when you look at an ellipse, then you know the full ellipse, half ellipse, quarter ellipse, the uh, classical dynamics is regular, and everywhere in between you have uh, chaoticity. I mean, for three these cases, you have a second constant of motion, which is something like the product of the angular momenta of the, uh, with respect to the two foci. And, um, and the otherwise, you find a mixed regular chaotic dynamics. Here, I show one example for an angle of 60 degrees. So you have very tiny um, islands of regularity when you look carefully. So we just got this. And here, I just show results for ellipses with a large eccentricity, another one with a small eccentricity, where small eccentricity means that you are close to a half circle, to a circle. Yeah, in this case to a half circle because we are at 180 degree. And then when you look here, you can see that when you have a large eccentricity, you are close to Poisson, both in short and long range correlations, whereas in this case, you are close to GOE. For small eccentricity, that is when you are close to a circle. And this can be understood when looking at uh, wave functions and when looking at the, trace, uh, the corresponding trace formula. I mean, here I show for large eccentricity, you will have many wave functions which look like that. So here I only show, show the results for the first component, for the second it's uh, similar. So you have, in this case, you see many wave functions of this type and some the whispering gallery type and some which look a bit chaotic. Whereas when you go to small eccentricity, you find many which look chaotic and some which seem to be uh, localized along the diameter orbit. So in this case, you find many wave functions which, see, uh, which are like the liberation, like modes um, which co would correspond to liberation in the corresponding classical billiard. And these are better described by rectangular so it's similar to what you see in a rectangular billiard. And there's the whispering gallery modes like this one or these are correspond to um, whispering gallery-like modes in the regular case. And with increasing eccentricity, that is when you go from here to here, then the region, the region of liberation increases, so you see more and more wave functions of this type, and in the end you we'll see something which is clo much closer to Poisson than in the case of small eccentricity. So here I show two other examples. One is a 60 degree ellipse sector. There you expect GUE because the classical dynamics is chaotic and you see indeed find GUE. And I compare it here to the 90 degree, so to a quarter ellipse where which is regular, you would expect um, GUE, but here you again find something which is close to um, GOE. And in this case, the eccentricity doesn't play any role because in this case you don't have the problem with these uh, liberational modes. So they are much smaller. And um, yeah, you can again determine this parameter lambda and it's of the order of 0 0.7. So the, these are the results, yeah. And when you look at the length spectrum, you again find only orbits in the neutrino billiard, you again only find um, peaks at the length of periodic orbits which have an even number of reflections. So just to summarize this part, what, what did we do? We looked at a quantum billiard, which is, with the classical billiard is integrable. We looked at a quantum billiard, we looked at a graphene billiard in the vicinity of the band edges, in the vicinity of the drag point, here you find GOE. And the same when you look at the neutrino billiard, you find something which is um, GOE for a quarter, half, and for a quarter and a half. Um, so yeah, for all kinds of sector billiards in the circular case, except for, of course, a full circle. And now we try to understand this. Um, this is something we started only recently in terms of a semi classical approach where we. 
um, try to derive a trace formula. And to derive this trace formula, I use as starting point the boundary integral. I mean, here I write it down again for component psi1 and psi2, where I implemented uh, um, boundary conditions in each equation for here for psi2, here for psi1, to obtain one equation for psi1, one for psi2, and you don't have any singularities in the at uh, the singularities of H0 and H1. So no problems with any singularities. And um, now to obtain a trace formula, we proceeded as you would do in, in a quantum billiard. I mean, we discretize the integration variable and then you obtain a matrix. Instead of these um, two matrices, instead of these two terms, you obtain a matrix. You can write down the eigenvalue equation, which would, um, that is this equation, you can now write down in terms of a matrix equation of this form. So your spectral determinant and the zeros of this spectral determinant then give you the eigenvalues of your problem. And uh, now you can continue. I mean, the, that's the usual way. You take your spectral density, you write it in terms of the XP of um, the logarithm of the trace of this term here, then you can, um, yeah, you write down the matrix elements. The trace is given by a product of n matrices of this form, um, where you sum over the indices, and these sums over indices then are mapped back into integrals, and then you can um, do, that's what one usually would do, then you have a product of n integrals, and now you can use stationary phase approximation or in, in the case of a chaotic system, you use stationary phase approximation. In case of a integrable system, you have to use other methods. And finally, you then obtain, starting from this spectral determinant, you obtain a, a theta function. And um, the oscillating part of the rho of k, rho of k, is obtained by this gen relation between spectral determinant and rho of k. And then you will obtain a result which is, can be written as a usual um, semi-classical screen function multiplied with some amplitude. And this free factor, it essentially comes from, um, oops, no, yeah, in, from this part here. So this part here you have to expand. First you discretize, then you expand and it takes a large k limit. Then you get here an e to the i k term here. And if you put everything together, then you get in the end um, this amplitude factor A of n. It's given, it's quite, it looks quite complicated. Now then, depending on what kind of billiard you are looking at, you have to evaluate it, and then you get your trace formula. So, and I just, I mean, this has to be done, of course, now for half circle, half ellipse, for all these cases, which I showed to you. I just show the results for the full circle because I didn't have time to finish to do to prepare figures for half circle. But here you find here I show the um, uh, the length spectra for neutrino billiard compared to a quantum billiard. You again find um, that um, in this case only even reflections are possible, and this is ex exactly something which immediately comes out. I mean, when you do all this um, all this um, calculations, then you will have to take a trace, and this trace then will cancel out all terms which, are or which have an odd number of reflections. So this is a general result. And um, yeah, this is shown in the length spectrum. Here I just come chose a trace formula for the fourth full circle. Here I compare the fluctuating part of the eigenvalues of a circle, quant direct circle neutrino billiard with those of um, um, yeah, of this trace formula, and actually the trace formula is exactly the same as the one which Klaus Richter and Worm derived um, for um, circular graphene billiard. So it's exactly the same, even the phase factors and everything the same. I mean, they derived it for an infinite mass uh, confinement, so it's expected to be the same. And here I compare length spectra for the circular neutrino billiard with uh, with the length spectrum obtained from the trace formula, and again you find very good agreement. So this is just one example where I compare the neutrino trace formula with um, eigenvalues with length spectra obtained from eigenvalues, and I now I just want to conclude with some kind of an outlook. 
because, I mean, it's, uh, here we used a method which is similar to Vashini and Saraceno, and therefore I wanted to just to show these are quite new results. And here we looked at a neutrino billiard which had the shape of a Monza billiard. A Monza billiard has a hole. And furthermore, this Monza billiard belongs to the family of uh, billiards with unidirectional dynamics. So it's interesting per se. And one question was what happens with this unidirectionality when you look at a neutrino billiard. And the other one, of course, is that it's um, quite a numerical um, you need to put a lot of effort in the numerical determination of wave for eigenvalues because you have to deal with spurious eigenvalues and with missing eigenvalues if you use a general boundary integral, but we use an expanded one. So now this unidirectionality, it leads to the fact that the phase space is divided into two disjoint parts, one part for clockwise motion, one part for uh, anti-clockwise motion, and they are separated by bouncing ball orbits, which bounce back and forth perpendicular between the walls here in this case, and here, and here along the circle. So you have um, bouncing ball orbits, and um, the classical dynamics in each of the two regions, I mean, uh, is fully chaotic. This was tested, I mean, this billiard was proposed in a paper by Beble, Posen, and Robnik. And they actually proposed an uh, expanded boundary integral method, which we then extended to neutrino billiards. And this expanded boundary integral method actually is based on the uh, basic idea by Vashini and Saraceno in their paper on quantum billiards. So I will have finished soon. So here I just show some examples of wave functions. Here you have wave functions psi 1, psi 2, which look quite chaotic. Here you can see the current, and we also find many bouncing ball-like modes. So now for these bouncing ball-like modes, I used again the trace formula for neutrinos to derive an expression for the bouncing balls in the neutrino monster billiard. It's similar to the one which was derived by Martin Sieber, uh, Craig, um, Uzis Milanski, Little John. So for stadium billiard, it's ex exactly the same except that you have to, here you put, of course, the length of the boundary where you have these bouncy ball orbits and this RD is just the width of your monster billiard. And you can see that they very well describe the um, uh, fluctuate or slow oscillations in the fluctuating part of the eigenvalues of um, the monster billiard and the also the length spectrum. You can see that bouncy ball modes have a very a big influence uh, for small lengths and then um, they somehow disappear. But uh, the as in a stadium billiard, as in a monster billiard, you see clear deviations from um, whatever you expect. In this case, you expect something between two GOE or couple GOE when the matrices and here you see it's typical, also it's similar to what you see in a stadium billiard when you look at when you compare with GOE. But when you now take out these bouncing ball orbits by just using this trace formula, then you find a very good agreement with TGO, two GOE. And this essentially also means that you have, in this case, you have two independent GOEs, that this dynamical tunneling doesn't seem to play, play such an important role in neutrino billiards. So thank you for your attention. Barbara, in the in the plot that you showed up from the graphene, yes, you compute the the graphene, the density of states, and experimentally and yeah. uh, numerics by.